And today we're going to discuss some really exciting discoveries about the planet Jupiter. The massive giant that we're all familiar with, that even today is still hiding so many mysteries. But specifically, we're going to focus on one study that seems to suggest that back in the days, when the solar system was just starting, Jupiter was a lot larger in size. And there's a very interesting way how scientists were able to figure this out. And so let's discuss some of these discoveries in more detail. But first, let's take a look at some of the new imagery produced by NASA, mostly based on the observations from the James Webb and from the Hubble Space Telescope. And so extremely recently, in one of the recent observations, researchers were able to observe Jupiter's aurora. And more specifically, they were able to capture the aurora using two completely different wavelengths, the infrared from the James Webb and the ultraviolet observations from the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is actually the entire image of Jupiter in the ultraviolet produced by Hubble. And one of the reasons researchers wanted to observe the aurora is because they want to understand how they differ from other planets, such as for example planet Earth, especially since on Jupiter, unlike planet Earth, the aurora are also caused by its moon Io. And so it's not just the Sun, it's also one of its moons. And the main focus was to see how quickly the aurora can change compared to the ones on our own planet. And the initial assumption was that a typical aurora might take an hour or so to completely dissipate, kind of similar to what we usually see around our own planet. But instead, the observations revealed something entirely different. Here, the variation was basically in seconds, with some aurora appearing and disappearing mere seconds in between. And mostly because a lot of the ionized hydrogen that seems to cause the aurora seems to only be able to stay in Jupiter's atmosphere for approximately half a minute. And because in this case it also affects the overall temperature of Jupiter, here it results in an extremely quick changes in temperature that seem to occur in mere seconds several times per day. But intriguingly enough, the observations between Hubble and James Webb were somewhat different. Or basically some of the brightest lights visible in the infrared didn't actually have counterparts in the ultraviolet emissions, suggesting there's a lot of complexity we still don't understand and suggesting that Jupiter's aurora are potentially formed in a somewhat different way from planet Earth. But in essence, this study highlights how little we know about Jupiter, and especially how little we know about its formation history and its moons. As a matter of fact, in one of the more recent studies, researchers tried to figure out how its moons could have even formed. Now, we currently know of 95 moons around Jupiter, but for the most part we have no idea exactly how they came to be. But it was always believed to be the result of some kind of a breaking apart of the initial disk that was basically formed by the Jupiter itself. And that's because just like the Sun, Jupiter was also surrounded by a circumplanetary disk that eventually coalesced into its moons. And it's by using this disk and the assumptions about it that researchers were able to figure out so much about Jupiter's history. For example, here by using a new simulation, researchers realized that the disk potentially contained at least two distinct regions. There was an inner ring and an outer ring. And over time, as the inner ring expanded, it basically produced a bunch of shadows in the outer ring, which would suddenly have reduced temperature in certain parts of the disk. And it was extremely likely that it was these shadows that eventually started to coalesce into most of the larger moons of Jupiter. This was recently confirmed in one of the simulations, and the study by Antoine Schneeberger and Olivier Moussy that you can find in the description. But it was really by using the assumption about this disk that scientists were now able to work out something somewhat unusual about early Jupiter. It seems to have been much, much larger in size initially, and was potentially as large as two and a half times its current radius. In other words, early Jupiter was potentially almost three times bigger in size and contained an enormous magnetic field, much, much stronger than anything today. And so let's discuss this somewhat recent study and what scientists were able to discover, but specifically discuss the somewhat brilliant technique they used for this that allowed them to calculate the initial size of this beautiful planet. Now, first of all, the first few millions of years in the formation history of the solar system are still kind of mysterious to us. And that's because we have a lot of uncertainties in regards to some of the earliest models and in regards to how planets basically form, especially planets like Jupiter. But since Jupiter is so massive and since it's sometimes referred to as the architect of the solar system, trying to understand its formation history is obviously important in order to figure out what happened in the first hundred million years. But the question is, how do you even go back in time so much in order to figure out any of this? 
how can researchers possibly know how big or how small Jupiter was? Well, intriguingly, this all goes back to that disk once again. But this time, another somewhat bizarre region formed around Jupiter as a result of its very powerful magnetic field. Because here, the magnetic field would extremely likely prevent the disk from forming too close. Or basically, Jupiter would contain what's known as magnetospheric truncation. A region where the magnetic lines would just dissipate any particle, sort of leaving an empty space between the disk and the planet itself. And so technically, by figuring out how large or how small this area was, we can then figure out how fast Jupiter was spinning and eventually figure out its initial size. And it turns out there is a way to do this by looking at the orbits of some of its moons. Now, the majority of its moons are pretty easy to explain, but there are a couple that seem to have somewhat strange parameters. Here's one of them, Amalthea. This is a moon that's much closer to Jupiter than Io, but it does have somewhat strange eccentricity and inclination. Now, it's actually not that dramatic, but it's dramatic enough to potentially have some kind of an additional explanation. In other words, as Amalthea orbits Jupiter, it does have an eccentricity of 0 0.003 and an inclination of 0.37 degrees. Barely visible, but visible. And the reason it's unusual is because it should technically all be zero. Just because it's so close to Jupiter and because it's practically inside the rings. And we know that all of the particles inside the rings have circular orbits and zero inclination. And it's not just Amalthea. There are quite a few moons that seem to have something similar. For example, Adrastea and Metis also have just a little bit of inclination and a little bit of eccentricity. But it's the moon Thebe that seems to have the most. 0 0.018 eccentricity with an inclination of 1.08 degrees. And so these non-zero values point at some kind of an interaction with something else. And that something else has always been proposed to be Io. As a matter of fact, this study from 2004 goes in a lot of detail explaining how Io most likely changed the eccentricity and the inclination of all of these moons over time. But it can only do so by migrating toward Jupiter. In other words, the influence of the innermost satellite Io may only be explained if Io migrated from somewhere else as well. And turns out there is a way to kind of figure out where it came from or how much it traveled over time by essentially figuring out the changes in the orbits of these moons. And so by working out the orbital dynamics of some of the Jupiter's moons, researchers worked out what seems to have happened in the first four million years of the existence of Jupiter. And here we have two major steps. The first step happened when Jupiter was much larger and contained an extremely powerful magnetic field, and the second step was when it shrunk and became somewhat similar to how it is today, with the moons beginning their outward motion. Or just to rephrase this, at first the moons were migrating towards Jupiter, with the inner moon stopping at the edge of the disk, but afterwards there was a tidal migration, with the moons slowly being pushed away, with all of them eventually ending up in their current location. And so because Io was moving very slowly toward and then away from Jupiter, its gravity gave the smaller moons an occasional push. And these gravitational excitations, which can also be referred to as resonances, produce the inclination and the eccentricity we seem to observe. And so here it becomes possible to work out the initial location or initial position and the final position for the migration of Io. And so for example, if Io started migrating from too close to Jupiter, it would have tilted Amalthea way too much. Whereas if it started farther away, it would not have tilted Thebe enough, which allowed researchers to pinpoint the exact changes in Io's orbit. And this magnetospheric truncation is basically a region where Jupiter's magnetic field completely cut off the disk. This was believed to be at a distance of about 3.6 to maybe 4.4 radii of Jupiter. And this is believed to be the location where Io settled as well. Intriguingly, these magnetic forces that also cut off the disk, at the same time, control the overall spin of Jupiter as well. And so basically, the size of the disk edge was directly connected to Jupiter's spin rate, with the initial spin of Jupiter potentially being anywhere from about 1.1 days to maybe about 1.6 days maximum. This is actually much higher than today, because current day on Jupiter is only about 9.93 hours, or about 0. 414 days. With the implication being that Jupiter was much, much larger, it was also spinning much slower, but eventually coalesced and shrunk into a much denser object. And so by knowing exactly how fast it's spinning now, and by knowing exactly where Io used to be, 
scientists worked out that it was probably approximately two to maybe two and a half times as large as it is today. Or basically, it contracted quite dramatically over the next several billion years. And this is not really that surprising because this is kind of consistent with how we think giant planets probably form in the first hundred million years of the existence of the star system. And so it's quite likely that all of the gas giants out there essentially experience this gravitational contraction and the reduction in size, acceleration in spin, and the decrease of the magnetic field as well. Because in this case, it was also discovered that the magnetic field was at least 50 times as powerful, with the peak size and the peak magnetic field being reached approximately 3.8 million years after the formation of the solar system. Now, obviously, it's not entirely clear what effect this would have had on the rest of the solar system yet, or even what effects this would have on the moons near Jupiter, but by figuring out these first steps here, scientists can now maybe work out why and how the solar system changed in the last four and a half billion years. With this model also confirming that it's quite likely that all of these really large planets basically formed through the process known as the core accretion, essentially a rocky core rapidly gathering gas around itself and growing to these massive sizes in just a few hundred thousand years. Which is exactly what seems to have happened to Jupiter. But I guess the next question is, is this also something that happened to Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus? And so maybe, by using some of the moons around those objects, we can also figure out what happened to them as well, and eventually make conclusions about other exoplanets, because this is maybe something that happens everywhere. And so until future discoveries, check out some of the previous videos in the description, Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon, which now contains a lot of unreleased videos and a lot of other stuff you might have not seen before, maybe join the channel membership, or consider buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.